Okay. Well, um, anyway, as I was saying back in March, um, before I was so rudely interrupted, um, this is this feels a little weird, uh, but a real pleasure too to be back here on the sixth floor where where the workshop was meant to be. It's really good to see you all. I'm, I'm Zachary Lesser of the English department, and I'm joined as always by the co-organizers of the, the workshop, John Pollack, Curator of Research Services in the Kislak Center, and Jerry Singerman, now Senior Humanities Editor Emeritus at uh, Penn Press. Congratulations. We're lucky he's chosen to enjoy his retirement by spending it with us each Monday evening. Um, yeah, <laughs> even, even without the Peking duck, um, which reminds me uh, to remind you that unfortunately for the time being, we won't be able to adjourn uh, for supper after the workshop. And this is too bad because it, it is actually an integral part of the work of the seminar, I think. Um, not merely an excuse to eat and drink together, though it is that, uh, but some wonderful and important conversations happen over supper. And I'm calling it supper in honor of Peter. Uh, of course, um, and we hope that conditions allow us to return to Sankey at some point this year. Um, further logistical information, the biggest silver lining for us last year was the huge number of people who were able to join the workshop from afar on Zoom. And we're test driving our new hybrid format tonight. Hopefully everyone on the Zoom can hear me uh, and we'll be able to hear our speaker. It's possible you will not be able to hear the questions from people in the room though you should be able to hear the answers, so you'll probably be able to infer some of the questions. Um, and you're welcome to pose questions yourself by using the chat, and we'll try to get to some of those questions in Q&A as well. Um, I, yeah. Yes, we, you do need, if you, if uh, anyway, we always pass the sign-in sheet around. Please do sign this time especially. If you're not a pen person, you, you must sign in as part of a test thing that you're vaccinated and, and being here. Um, okay, I also want to welcome our new Bristol Schoenberg Fellow in the History of Material Text, Eileen Malcolm. Eileen is completing a PhD in Medieval Studies in the English Department, working on the relationship between poetry, the life sciences, and environmental change. Eileen has an MA from The Ohio State University and an interesting title for this degree, a Bachelor of Arts and Science in Environment from McGill. Um, and you'll get to hear some of Island's research in the spring semester, though while you wait for that, you can also watch a delightful 60 second lecture that Island did with Emily Steiner on lost medieval words, so you can learn what a canker dort is. Um, our lexicographic speaker tonight probably already knows, uh, which brings me to Jack Lynch. Jack received his PhD from Penn in 1998, and since then he's been at Rutgers Newark where he is now professor of English and now no longer chair of the department. <laughs> just, in, just in time for that mini series. Um, he's the author of The Age of Elizabeth and The Age of Johnson, Deception and Detection in 18th Century Britain and many trade books, including You Could Look It Up, The Reference Shelf from Ancient Babylon to Wikipedia, The Lexicographer's Dilemma, The Evolution of Proper English from Shakespeare to South Park, and Becoming Shakespeare. And he's currently working on a reader's guide to the Oxford English Dictionary. I believe I've gathered from his Twitter feed that he enjoys a bottle of good wine, uh, which we won't be able to offer him tonight, not even a bad glass, but he's come anyway. Uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome you back to Penn and Jack will be speaking on real fakes and fake fakes, materiality and literary forgery. All right, as I mentioned to the organizers, I came down with a breakthrough case of COVID about a month ago, and this is my first day out into the world. So I'm feeling a little woozy and will do my best to stay focused. But, uh, if you have any trouble hearing me, nudge me, throw something at me. Uh, all right, am I vis uh, I'm backlit on the, the Zoom, but that's all right. And I can see it. All right, I think we're ready to go. It's said that real life criminal prosecutors are often frustrated with the lay public's preconceptions about how felons are brought to justice. 
jurors brought up on a steady diet of police procedurals now expect every case to be solved with the latest cutting edge technology. Television has taught them that every vandalized mailbox will be solved using fractography, blood spatter analysis, and DNA sequencing. So widespread is the effect that the legal profession refers to the CSI effect. And now I'm not going forward. Let's see, does that work? There we go. Things aren't quite so bad among discussions of literary crime scenes, but lay folks still have at least an inchoate notion that detecting literary fakes should be a straightforward and technical matter. Can't you just test the paper? Can't you have a mass spectrometer analyze the ink? But it's rarely that simple in real life. And perhaps most surprising for moderns, who expect the cluster of approaches we call the sciences to be able to settle all these questions. Disputes over authenticity almost never depended on material evidence before the mid 19th century. Today, I'd like to muse on what we might call the prehistory of the material investigation of these illicit imitations. Mind you, materials science can play a role in modern investigations of forgeries. Today, we discern whether this is a genuine old master painting or a mere modern imitation by putting it under ultraviolet light to look for characteristically modern pigments. A potentially forged banknote is subjected to microscopy to scrutinize ink and paper. Suspicious archaeological discoveries may be subjected to radiocarbon dating, mass spectrometry, spectrometry, even forensic palynology. There's one for the <laughs> lexicographical crowd, which is the study of ancient pollen. <laughs> Just a few weeks ago, a team at Yale settled, one hopes forever, the long agitated question of the authenticity of the so-called Vinland map, in which macro X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy showed 20th century titanium ink in a supposedly 15th century map. Scientists, Zach was right about the wine thing, scientists have looked for traces of a rare isotope to investigate whether wines said to come from Thomas Jefferson's personal cellar were genuine. Before the nuclear tests of the 1940s, cesium-137 did not exist in nature. Afterwards, it can be found in every living thing. So a wine supposedly from 1787 that contains cesium-137 was made from grapes grown after 1942. And yet, there was very little material investigation of fakes in the age I study, the 18th century. It was, however, the age in which the rudiments of the material investigation of forgery were, if not developed, then at least imagined. I'm going to make the case that by paying attention to material approaches to forgery, fakery, and fraud, in an age that was not yet thinking about materials in this way, we can better understand the origins of modern forensic techniques and our own conceptions of authenticity. Now, of course, things were forged in the 18th century as they are in every period. Counterfeit money has always been a source of anxiety and it became vastly more so in the first great age of paper money. Every young aristocrat on the grand tour returned with a few grand master paintings. And after the discovery of Herculaneum, a private collection of classical sculpture was mandatory. <laughs> Most of it bogus, either whole cloth forgeries or exercises in bricolage that might as well be forgeries. Roman Catholics continued to be bamboozled by greedy hucksters hawking saints relics, but the fact is we see precious little examination of things as things before the middle of the 19th century. What does get disputed 
before that is literary forgery. And the 18th century is widely and correctly recognized as a great age of literary hoaxes and impostures. Material things are rarely discussed because we generally deal only with texts, not artifacts, disembodied words rather than their physical manifestations. When we're asked to judge whether an ostensibly ancient song is authentic or forged, there is nothing to put into a machine. And so we engage in a kind of forensics, but it's a forensic rhetoric, not forensic science. The most famous 18th century forger is James McPherson, who in 1759 published Fragments of Ancient Poetry, attributed to a third century Scottish bard, Ossian. The fragments created a stir in a post culloden Scotland, eager for signs of cultural superiority and priority to England. We now know, though, there was no Ossian. The works published as his contained bits of genuine traditional material and a few extracts from old Gaelic manuscripts, but the rest was Macpherson's invention. It produced one of the most prolonged and divisive literary debates of the century. And here, the lack of material embodiment caused Macpherson no end of grief. The curious demanded a glimpse of the manuscripts and Macpherson brazenly insisted he'd put them on display in a bookshop before the controversy erupted, but since no one came to examine them, he refused to do it again. <laughs> you had your chance, you didn't take it. Samuel Johnson captured the public response well when he said, the editor or author never could show the original. To revenge reasonable incredulity by refusing evidence is a degree of insolence with which the world is not yet acquainted. Now, it may seem that Johnson here is simply resorting to common sense, but his comments closely echo the technical language of contemporary legal treatises on what was called the best evidence rule. By the way, this image comes from the brand new Oxford edition of Johnson's Journey to the Western Islands, co-edited by your most humble and obedient servant and available wherever fine books are sold. <laughs> Even when there were physical manuscripts to examine, virtually no useful material tests had been developed. As yet, no chemist had proposed a technique for analyzing ink or paper. The first time the chemical examination of a writing medium played a role in discerning its authenticity was the Königinhofer Handschrift, a supposed medieval manuscript in 1858-59, when a test revealed the presence of Prussian blue, a strictly modern pigment. Before that, the 18, late 1850s, the tests, if we can call them that, were cruder, Edmund Malone, the 18th century's most energetic debunker of forgeries, paid attention to watermarks when he examined putatively old texts, but few others thought about books or manuscripts as physical objects. When, for instance, in 1770, two men were accused of forging a will, the Crown called as a witness the papermaker, James Watman, whose firm had made the paper. The disputed will was dated 1764. Watman looked at his own watermarks and testified that the paper could only have been manufactured in or after 1768. Evidence of this sort was still a novelty and 18th century juries not brought up on the CSI effect found it difficult to follow. Watman's patience in answering the prosecutor's questions reveals that the line of questioning was itself new. By the way, with similar cases of deception in mind, 
paper makers of the late 18th and early 19th century began putting a date of manufacture in the watermark itself, making it visible even to the untrained eye and making my own life a thousand times easier as I try to pursue a forger through the early 19th century. On the few occasions when material evidence was brought to bear on literary forgery, critics were skeptical of its value. Macpherson's most important successor, Thomas Chatterton, discovered not merely ancient texts, but manuscripts by the supposed 15th century Bristol poet, Thomas Rowley. But even with physical documents to scrutinize, critics on both sides paid much more attention to orthography, metaphors, oh, there's got a mention there, uh, orthography metaphors, the character of the 15th century lyric than to the texture of the parchment or the way the ink interacted with the surface. Maybe most surprising to modern sensibilities, many critics found their determinative evidence in prosody, in a conviction that these cannot be 15th century poems because they do not employ characteristically 15th century scansion. Others resorted to less clearly defined criteria. Thomas Wharton was emphatic that material evidence was weaker than good old fashioned literary taste. He said, I could mention many other circumstantial evidences relating to the process and management of this forgery but I do not wish to rest my proof on evidence of this nature. It is not from the complexion of ink or of parchment that this controversy is to be finally and effectually adjusted. Our argument should be drawn from principles of taste, from analogical experiment, from a familiarity with ancient poetry and from the gradations of composition. We shouldn't chide 18th century critics for lacking knowledge or imagination. Many times they understood the principles of counterfeit prevention, but the science was not yet able to deliver the necessary results. In fact, though they concern themselves with words rather than things, they developed some of the same principles that scientists would adopt in their wake. The disqualifying power of an anachronism, for instance, <laughs> has been utterly central to the detection of literary forgeries since the 15th century. But the technique really came into its own in the 18th century as historicism became a norm. Historicism, which is to say the sense that different ages have different characters, and that we don't live in one unchanging present, that was a necessary precondition to the belief that natural methods could help us date artifacts from centuries ago. Many critics date the intellectual breakthrough to 1440 when Lorenzo Valla definitively discredited the donation of Constantine by pointing out that it employed language that could not possibly have been used in the fourth century. But while Valla does deserve credit for the breakthrough, few critics seem to have understood the practical value of anachronism detection until the 18th century. And without that conceptual breakthrough, carbon-14 dating would be meaningless. <clears throat> Pardon me, I've got a preposterously dry mouth and I'm getting a mouthful of lint as I speak. <clears throat> the 17th and 18th centuries also gave us a new understanding of probability, not merely what we can call the aleatory probability, but the, that describes the frequency with which repeated events happen, but the kind of epistemic probability that allows us to say something like, I'm 99% sure I turned off the burner. Again, this is an essential precondition of scientific confidence intervals. And the 18th century debates over the authenticity of literary forgery provided us with the principle that authenticity 
will stand up to any and all tests, whereas a single failed test is a sign of inauthenticity. The legal maxim of falsum in uno, falsum in omnibus. These things may seem obvious, mere common sense, but that's to take our own worldview for granted. These insights have histories, and all these lessons from textual forgery found their way into the forensic scientific methodology of the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. The 18th century also developed principles that have informed not only counterfeit detection, but counterfeit protection ever since. We have to allow as a matter of principle that if a legitimate issuer of say a banknote can do something, then theoretically someone else can do that same thing. The hope therefore has been to ratchet up the difficulty and to put the effort required to produce a genuine artifact beyond the means of most fakers. A banknote includes the security protections that are in theory reproducible, but may still be enough to ward off all but the most committed forgers. Gone are the days when a color photocopier could produce counterfeit currency. Oh, bless you. The idea of intentionally incorporating difficulty into production methods as a means of warding off counterfeiting was first tried out with paper money in the 18th century. Benjamin Franklin, you may have heard of him here. Franklin tested a number of techniques for making banknotes harder to counterfeit in the 1730s. He began by using multiple typefaces increasing the difficulty for potential, potential counterfeiters to secure the materials. But if one printer could obtain several typefaces, so could another. Complex type ornaments were more difficult to reproduce. Franklin cut some new ornaments himself. Still, it was not enough. Counterfeiting is, after all, its own reward. And if you're sufficiently committed to the enterprise, you can earn enough to compensate for the added difficulty. Pardon me. But Franklin managed to produce an image beyond the power of even the most skilled engravers. He wanted to thwart mimesis altogether by cutting out the process of imitation. In August 1739, he introduced a 20 shilling note bearing the imprint of three blackberry leaves on a sprig and a willow leaf with stipules, the first of a number of banknotes made with leaves. It took until 1964 for the world to realize that these patterns were not mere decorations, but anti-counterfeit devices. And Franklin's secret process allowed him to reproduce the complicated pattern of the veins of a leaf on paper, not by recreating it manually as an engraver, but by allowing the leaf itself to impress its image directly on the page without human intervention. As a result, it had a degree of complexity that no human engraver could reproduce. As Joseph Freintnall put it in the caption, to his own botanical prints, they were engraven by the greatest and best engraver in the universe. <laughs> in other words, banknotes are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Of course, once God has made the tree, counterfeiters can use it too for nefarious ends. And that reminds us of the limits of even the most sophisticated forensic techniques. In 1756, the Reverend Francis Gastrell, Vicar of Frodsham, I love that title. <laughs> Francis Gastrell, Vicar of Frodsham, lived in New Place, which is the house to which Shakespeare retired. 
This, mind you, is 1756 is right around the time when Shakespeare is becoming Shakespeare. But Gastrell was unimpressed. And he was annoyed by the tourists who were showing up at his house, jumping his fence, and breaking pieces off the mulberry tree that grew in his garden, which, legend had it, was planted by Shakespeare himself. There's even some chance that legend could be true. The timing works out. It could be. To spite the bardolaters, therefore, Gastrell chopped down the tree. A clever local watchmaker, one Thomas Sharp, bought the wood and spent the next 60 years selling trinkets made from the wood of the mulberry tree. And as with fragments of the true cross, the pieces of the Shakespeare mulberry reunited would fill a forest. I am proud to say that after a decade's search, I at last bought a piece of the original mulberry tree, a snuff box, with the provenance going back at least to 1812. And I will tolerate no suggestion that my piece is anything less than genuine. <laughs> I have left my sacred relic at home, but John was kind enough to fetch some of the wood here in Penn's collection. Uh, so on the table, do have a look, it's, it's delightful. Um, but this serves as a reminder that even the most sophisticated technology has its limitations. Imagine even if we had the money to call in the crack dendrochronological team and that told them to fire up the carbon-14 detectors, it would tell us little. Sharp relied on God to make the trees, but he supplemented the original with plenty of other deity-produced trees. And there is no test to distinguish this trinket fashioned in the late 18th century from a 17th century mulberry tree from that trinket fashioned in the late 18th century from a different 17th century mulberry tree. Another set of indistinguishable fakes is even more disconcerting because the distinction we have to make is between real fakes and fake fakes. One of the purchasers of Mulberry Wood was Samuel Ireland, an engraver who worshiped Shakespeare. His son was William Henry Ireland. And William rarely got any affection from his father, but when young Ireland, quote, discovered a legal deed bearing Shakespeare's own signature, he got the paternal affection he had longed for. And the story mostly writes itself from this point. He responded by discovering still more documents from Shakespeare's pen. Eventually, Ireland Pater, completely credulous, published the lot as miscellaneous papers. And we have a copy of the folio here. The Shakespeare papers were the literary story of 1795-96. Literary London divided into factions, which clashed when that long lost Shakespearean masterpiece, say it with me, Vortigern and Rowena, <laughs> was played at Drury Lane as Shakespeare's. It was a disaster. By the day of the premiere, the critics had convinced the public that the fines were phony. These skeptics, mind you, depended on old fashioned textual criticism, not material, focusing especially on Ireland's wacky, silent E riddled orthography and his anachronisms. Though I've said material objects played only a small part in 18th century investigations of authenticity, Ireland did think about his manuscripts as physical things. He worried, for instance, that the paper might betray him. So he used only genuine early 17th century paper, razoring blank leaves out of old books in London bookstalls. He formulated ink that seemed to have gone brown with age, and he distressed his manuscript with soot and tears to give a patina of age. He tried to alter a 200-year-old wax seal, though without success, it crumbled. 
But these concerns barely featured in the public discussion of the papers, mostly because Samuel Ireland, the father, strictly controlled who was able to see them. And he rigidly excluded uncandid critics. Those who failed to get past his gates were forced to consult only the texts in the miscellaneous papers. But while physical objects played a small role in the exposure of the imposture, they do feature in Ireland's afterlife. After the failure of Vortigern, young Ireland lived another 39 years as a bitter, washed up hack writer, angry that the world refused to recognize his genius. But while the, his new works were mostly ignored, his notorious past was making his original autograph forgeries valuable. So when his funds ran low, he pasted the original Shakespearean papers into an extra illustrated album. This was after all the age of Grangerizing. And he sold them to a book collector eager to own a souvenir of the big forgery scandal of 1795. Then he sold another set of the original forgeries <laughs> to another collector and another and another. He spent much of his adult life mass producing counterfeits of his own forgeries, billing nearly all of them as the originals, the authentic forgeries. So for instance, the love letter to Anna Hathaway was a particular favorite. <laughs> Ireland was forging his forgeries, or if you prefer, forging himself, passing the fake fakes off as real fakes. By now, I have personally handled 30 putatively unique copies <laughs> of the love letter to Anne Hathaway. I know of one more that was destroyed in a fire, and I believe I know of a few more in private hands. Many of the Anglophone world's great libraries own some of these originals. And I've had to break the sad news to many of them that their unique treasure was in fact prepared on a kind of production line. <laughs> but why is that news disappointing? These artifacts are in the eyes of material science indistinguishable. They were all done on authentic early 17th century paper and they've been forged in the same ink by the same hand. How could a scientific approach distinguish one from the other? And more important, is the question itself even meaningful? Meditating on the material practices of forgery obliges us to ask why we should consider the 28th love letter any faker than the first. <clears throat> fakers tend to attract other fakers. Ireland's first account of his shenanigans was a pamphlet called An Authentic Account of the Shakespearean Papers, published in December 1796. It was almost the only book Ireland ever wrote where readerly demand exceeded booksellers' supply. <laughs> And in 1804 or so, its scarcity prompted someone to issue a pirated edition. It is a very good piracy. There are three very small textual variants. But the sharp-eyed will notice that this book, supposedly printed in 1796, is on paper watermarked 1803 and 1804. And Penn has, and I believe John called up, a copy, we do have one of the, um, the counterfeit of the book about the forgery here. So. <laughs> and I love this, the piracy was good enough that Ireland himself inscribed some copies of this edition, apparently unaware that it was an unauthorized reprint of his own book. Okay, I have offered few strong arguments in this whirlwind tour of 18th century fakes, but I hope I've suggested that the questions forgery investigators put to texts about anachronism, consistency, and probability 
informed the questions later investigators put to paper fibers and ink chemistry. In other words, this is the era when the conceptual foundations were being laid that would allow more materially based methods of forgery detection to flourish in the 19th century. I hope to, I have raised the question, albeit certainly without answering it, about what we mean when we speak of forgery and authenticity. Aesthetic philosophers are fond of imagining some futuristic technological breakthrough that could produce, say, a molecule for molecule replica of the Mona Lisa, such that not even the most sophisticated test could ever tell them apart, the ultimate mimesis. Would we still value the real one over the fake and on what grounds? The 18th century had no Star Trek style replicators to use as analogies and wasn't much impressed, truth be told, with the Mona Lisa. But hucksters like Thomas Sharp and William Henry Ireland, along with critical investigators like Samuel Johnson and Edmund Malone, intuitively understood similar underlying ideas well before even the most rudimentary technologies for investigating material forgeries had come into being. Thank you. Okay, let's open to questions in the room and I don't know if you want to just give a wave if you wanna. Thanks very much for that. Though. I have a, 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 a simple, <laughs> I don't know the answer to the question. Um, the title page of what we would say Ossian has Ossian written in by hand. So the name, the name of the author who doesn't exist doesn't appear on the title page. Um, what, what is the story behind that and when do we come to know the Ossianic text as being you know, written by Ossian? Cool. Complicated story, quick version. I, I simplified there. The first book to come out was 1759, Fragments of Ancient Poetry, which comes with a preface saying, I have reason to believe there are whole length epic poems out there. And if encouragement were given, <laughs> I could find them. That was called dropping a hint. Encouragement was given, and he went out and found two whole epic poems, and those had the author's name on the title page. At the same time that McPherson was publishing those, Hugh Blair was writing long, 100-page introductory essays spelling out what we know about Ossian and his world. So it was a, a dance between McPherson and Blair to get that out into the world. People at the time would have known Ossian as a sort of legendary figure, but no one had anything like a text attributable to him. So it was a, a name waiting for an attribution. It took, I mean, that the fight over the Ossianic poems, if you want to get take the, the extreme, it, it hasn't entirely been settled yet. Big milestone came in 1805 when a major report was issued. Uh, in the mid 1950s, someone who actually knows the Gaelic went through and, and said what we can say with some confidence. As it happens, um, about a quarter to a third of the, the fragments probably came from oral tradition. Scattered lines came from his reading in manuscripts, but virtually all of Fingal and Tamora, if I'm remembering which is which correctly, were whole cloth fabrications. Do most copies of that edition have Ossian's name written in, or has anybody done an inventory of that? I don't know. Um, it, it quickly became known. I don't know what collectors and libraries have done with it. The library often would write yeah. in the name. So I was going to ask you if these are library copies, because that's often the case. They will write it in. Yeah, um, and I imagine it depends when and how confident yeah. people were to do it and all of that. Not so much anymore, but they yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much.
it seems to me that one of the examples and that of Vietnam is quite a crucial one. Yeah. Because it's not just whether the paper money can be bought, but the existence of paper money itself was discussed at the time as um, not authentic because it is not the value in gold or whatever of the coin. And I've been looking at 18 and early 20th century people who have been fakers in of coins who then claimed because they fit coins, they can have authoritative um, evaluation methods of paper money because that's the fate of the fake. And it became particularly during the Napoleonic age yes. an issue because Napoleon founded his wars with the paper money and everybody wanted to be in rivalry with it. And states have paid off the, the printers in other states to produce paper. Yes, I've seen some of that. The, the, the 17th century is when Europe is reckoning with the, the shift from specie to fiat money. This is worth a pound because the crown says it's worth a pound. So there was an awful lot of suspicion in much of the world about whether this, this really counted for anything. And yes, you throw in then the anxiety that it would be relatively easy to fabricate. It led to a lot of suspicion. Now, in recent years, I think the those who know this sort of financial history well are saying actually paper money circulated more than conventional wisdom led us to believe uh, in, in the 17th, mostly the 18th century. And I think it was Sweden. Sweden was pioneering in this respect, but I don't remember. But yeah, it, it, and we certainly have the American um, model of this where through the, the Revolutionary War, the fledgling US government was issuing absurd amounts of money backed up by nothing and praying that they would be able to, to support those bills. So yeah, that was a, a whole additional layer of anxiety associated with whether these things, even if they were genuine, could be said to have any value. Jerry, I, I want to get to uh question in the chat, but uh, let's go to David and then Eileen can close that. I just wonder, Jack, have you ever been persuaded to take a view on the authenticity or fakery of the Song of Igor? Because it's exactly in the ballpark of all the issues you talked about, and also the time period. That it's, um, it rides the crest of the spread of the Ossian uh, narrative across Europe. Uh, it shows up in the 1790s. Um, it's the only pre-Mongolian invasion Russian text there is. It's very short. And it conveniently disappears, the manuscript in the Great Fire of Moscow of 1812. So it only physically exists for 15 years. And amazingly, uh, Russian philologists maintain, through philological analysis only, um, the authenticity of the Song of Igor. Well, you probably need to, because it's been played at the Sochi Olympics, you've got foreign and got yeah. Russia's got nothing else. But it's a massively over-determined case, I think. And the, the kind of issues you're bringing up uh, pertain to it. I have not, I have nothing like expertise on the Song of Igor. It, it is a fascinating case. It is parallel. And the thing that may well have been authentic, but then disappeared at an inopportune moment, I always associate that with another Shakespearean document where the will of Shakespeare's father was found in the rafters of the birthplace in Stratford, we have transcriptions of it, and then the thing is gone, and still having bloody fistfights over whether that's authentic and if forged by whom, how. Um, but no, I, I wish I knew more about that. If you know any sources, I'd love to hear about them. Helen, there's a question about Helen. Yeah, we have a couple of questions coming in from the chat. So Simon Stern says, uh, Jack, thanks for a wonderful talk. Curious whether you think that besides the best evidence rule, there are specific forensic developments during this era that facilitate this type of investigation, or whether this is an instance in which law largely awaits the developments of these scientific methods to acquire the ability to augment the data. There are, 
what, what is, is it William Gilbert's the last name is it William Gilbert I can't recall was the great writer in the first half of the 18th century in Britain on the law of evidence he, his work wasn't published until the middle of the 18th century I don't remember exactly when um, but that was well I mean, it, it's early codified writing on common law which was in short supply and that circulated really widely. I was surprised just how much technical language was coming straight from contemporary legal treatises and being applied to these debates over authenticity. The first one or two I, I noticed like that, I thought, oh, that's interesting that there's an analogy. These things are in the air. But certainly critics like Johnson and Wharton and Malone they knew these legal principles well, and they applied them strictly. They cited them at the, at the right times. So yeah, I, I don't have a good list of examples off the top of my head. I could dig them up if need be. Thank you. One of the things that struck me when you put up that great list of call numbers of the love letter is that Bolger had six of them. Yes. And, um, <laughs> You know, of course, he was well known at the time for, for being kind of, people thought he was crazy, given how many copies of the same books he bought. And, and that was his kind of distinctive collecting style. And I wonder, it, it seems like there's an interesting connection on your last point about, you know, what, what is a forgery, what is authentic in that case. There's something, I can't quite put my finger on that feels analogous to the way we think about the individual copy of an edition, mm -hmm. the idea that someone, other collectors like Huntington, you know, they wanted just the one copy. He would he would sell off other copies once he got a better one, and then someone like Folger, who's who's really looking at it from a very different perspective. Um, there's something about uniqueness in both cases that I wonder if you've seen any parallels to thinking about printed books in general and kind of the the way that libraries and other and collectors have imagined the value of copies of books which are themselves never unique i mean they're they're each unique and also none unique right. at the same time it's a very good question about for those following along at home um about the the, the value of individual copies whether it's just it's tissue paper for stuffing them to wrap things oh with. okay so we'll put it with that but this, um, yes, idea? you're right. Folger was one of very few, and he was also happy to have copies that were marked up and uh, that people like Huntington did not want to sully their hands with. My introduction to Ireland's mass production, and this was by no means my discovery. This was merely how I let me turn this I off. On what the world knew uh, when I was just um, getting interested in working on William Henry Ireland. Uh, at that time, Mike Barsanti, who many of you know, was so, so, at what do you back. We could have borscht, we could have peach paper. soup, either no. one. And no. I um, don't know. What, what have you got? Have... I don't know of anything that's supposed to be in Philadelphia. Uh, but there were all the most famous papers. Did we cook the greens How the yet? hell did no. they get I could cook some greens. Why has no one um, mentioned Put some peaches in the greens. Uh, no, I already cooked the peaches. Do you have any provenance information? Um, I could put tomatoes in the greens. He presented a folder <laughs> and a photo stack of right. a love letter to Anne Hathaway, um, which happened to be open put, in front of me that time, and they did not match. Also in the greens. Okay. And I don't pretend to be um, an expert. See, this is something you can't use, right? It's like something the things they are photographed. So I said, right, I'll go. Of I have a book. Oh, right. I thought this one didn't fit. A plate of this. I'm going to, and it didn't match oh. either of them. Um, I took it. I stole it from Paul and Kevin by the When they lived in Amsterdam. Right. And they didn't want it back. So I'm going to ask them about it. You did. I'm sure you asked them about it. And they said they didn't want it. But you could like ask them again. Original, the original forgeries. All right. Um, with other cook the greens. Doesn't seem to have eggs last night. Which is to say, he will sometimes do on do an album page. page. In yes, we do. 19th century. Want to make, uh, he will simply draw the document, uh, including the ragged margins and things like that, where if, if you uh, get within 10 feet of it, you can tell it's a drawing of. But he would mix these together in, in strange ways. And they always came with an attestation that these are the unique 
original papers often double, treble, underline. Um, it, yeah, mapping copies of manuscripts, copies of printed books. There, I'm trying to formulate some thoughts about Ireland himself, uh, who, as I said, he he was concerned about the the number of copies of his authentic account, which sold out. He used to boast how much that sold for at auction, um, and with with um, the the miscellaneous papers, supposedly large numbers of those were destroyed. So then the individual copies become more interesting. He was very conscientious about that, but I haven't formulated anything like a coherent answer for that. But thanks. Almost like the attestation, the fact that he signed it, that makes all the difference. It could be any old thing. But yeah, yeah. People just wanted him to attest to the other, because that's what he was famous for. Yes. Saying things are authentic. So yeah. even if it's an obvious fake, you want to get him faking yeah. that. It's yes. Like it's part of his signature. Incidentally, I, I, I put in writing that which of these, if any, is the original original is unknown and probably unknowable. And having stuck out my glass jaw, I was smashed by Arthur Freeman, who actually produced a very convincing argument that the papers at Harvard are for the most part, one set of papers from the Hyde Collection at Harvard are very likely the original originals. <laughs> His argument though, depended not on any high tech information, but his freakish ability to follow things through catalogs for 200 years and pay attention to the order in which items were listed in this catalog and that catalog. Uh, and if that's true, it's a pity because that set, he, Ireland often distressed his manuscripts by holding them over candle flames. And that set is almost completely illegible now. It's just black and if you, hold it up to the light just right, you can maybe make out there was ink. Uh, and I've got some other heuristics for figuring out which ones are likely original forgeries and which aren't. Is there another chat? So, um, oh, yeah. Um, uh, Wendy Pfeffer asks, any thoughts on what might push a contemporary author to create a forgery? Um, she's thinking in particular of Renée Toscano's 2009 edition of medieval poet Beatrice de Montalban. What might push a modern author to, to engage in that sort of forgery? One of the challenges we've got with, let's say, modern literary authors is some may well be engaging in this sort of hijinks with an ironic wink. And I think it would be important for us to take, to, to determine what sort of ethical stance we should take on any instance. Is mens rea involved or is this merely someone being playful and postmodern and Pierre Menard autour de la Quixote? Um, I, it amuses me to no end that Bob Dylan has come in trouble for vast stretches of plagiarism where he's inserted paragraphs from scholarly monographs on the Japanese Yakuza mafia into his songs and, and then attributing them to himself and then taking songs he wrote entirely by himself and attributing them to other people. I think he's screwing with us is what he's doing there. And I suspect that a lot of literary authors who are doing that sort of thing are playing with our notions of what is acceptable and what isn't, which often get boiled down to simple slogans that we recite to our students. Why other people might do it, if you go back far enough over history, there are concerns about national pride. Of course, money is always a concern if you can sell these things. And I think a whole lot of people just get a rush out of deceiving the world. Um, William Henry Ireland in particular, he, he was positively giggling with glee that his betters were completely taken in. Um, now, as it happens, the serious scholars of the day saw this stuff and immediately knew it was nonsense. 
the people who fancied themselves men of taste were the ones who fell for it. James Boswell fell on his knees and kissed the papers <laughs> and thanked the good Lord above. He had lived long enough to see them and he was dead eight weeks later. <laughs> so lived just long enough. Um, you know, people like that, Ireland adored making such people look ridiculous. So I mean, one of the curious things about some kinds of forgery is ideally you are never exposed in most cases. Sometimes you, you, know, you later reveal to the world, ha ha, I pranked you, but usually you want this to go undetected forever, which means you never get the validation and credit from the rest of the world you think you deserve. But that private sense of I fooled them counts for a lot. Thank you. I thanks uh, so much for talking about that. A couple of things. One that I thought was fascinating is that Ireland died in the context of the time that you said where these new techniques are not being you know, believed. He seems to kind of have an understanding of the, what becomes a CSI effect and then tries to enact that. They, is that like a kind of a, is he one of the only ones kind of paying attention to these new emergent kind of techniques and focusing? He had a point of problem with that. He focused too much on the forensic and forgot about the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. But at least he was doing that. So is that unique to him? Is that rampant? And kind of a, a corollary question to that is were uh were counterfeiters like him ever recruited? <laughs> like Frank Abagnale, you know, as you can yeah. come in and help with the new money and try to stop future counterfeiters because they learn these mm -hmm. uh, new emergent techniques for themselves for their own nefarious services and they have to be recruited. <laughs> Um, in that way, which is kind of a question because he seems to be uh, ahead, of the, ahead of the game for his day, but in the wrong direction. Yeah. Um, so, were, was Ireland alone in performing these sort of things with material goods that early? And were any of these forgers ever recruited? I don't know of anyone being recruited. Ireland was an early person to be conscientious about these sorts of things. And sometimes he did it so appallingly, you think he couldn't have been that conscientious about it. But it's clear that he was thinking in terms of these categories in a way that Chatterton does not seem to have thought at all. Chatterton was not studying 15th century hands. He, he just made up fantasy, late medieval, early, early modern stuff. And that was good enough for him. Um, Ireland was trying to imitate it and not always doing a good job. Um, and because, of course, I'm sitting in front of a bunch of people in real life and on a screen, I have utterly lost the name of um, the early 19th century, Collier, John Payne Collier. Collier is the one who managed to pull off the most sophisticated combination of awareness of the physical book and awareness of the textual materials to such a degree that if anything ever passed through his hands or might have passed through his hands, we have to be nervous. For those who don't know, in the, the early to mid 19th century, John Payne Collier who was one of the most distinguished Shakespeare scholars of his day. Uh, now, William Henry Ireland was not a distinguished scholar by any means. Collier really was, but he also doctored a whole lot of documents and he knew them well enough to document them convincingly. And he did not do things like discover love verses from Shakespeare to Anne Hathaway. He would do you know, just the slightest tweaks to what we knew to make them much, much harder to detect. And yet if he touched something, we now have to put an asterisk on any of our claims. And there, I, I think Collier may deserve credit as the pioneer of bringing together materiality of the text with the forgery to the point where we, we're still figuring it out. If anyone's interested, there's now a giant. Arthur Freeman is the one who smashed my glass jaw. He and his wife did a huge two-volume 
biography, descriptive bibliography on Collier that's astonishing. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for this talk. Um, my question is also about statistics, and I'm thinking a lot about poetry and literary objects and poetry and fiction, um, thinking back to the 1920s and how when Tinko first published Wallace and Crusoe, he claimed that it was a real story and a real person. <laughs> And therefore, like his reproduction of the journal was a real text. Yeah. Um, and of course, that later when he challenged the truth and said that fiction is true. Um, but I'm just sort of wondering with the mystery of the case, if we ever see this aspect of when the forgery is discovered, that it becomes a literary device sort of really wrapped up. Um, into it as something to read. Like, did people continue to read it after seeing that they thought it was a forgery? Um, you know, and did he ever try to market it that way in a way that later Gothic novels? Macpherson never acknowledged that these things were forged. And so much national pride was invested in these things that I don't think he could possibly. And they continued into the 19th century. In fact, one of Oscar Wilde's middle names is Oscar Fingal Wilde after the, one of the epic poems written by Ossian. It was a phenomenon that lasted a very long time. The one though, he didn't personally have a chance to ride on its fame, but Thomas Chatterton became the the genius whose forgeries weren't really forgeries but were an imaginative imaginative recreation of this world the romantic reaction to chatterton is remarkable and blake has in one of his notebooks william blake says i believe that what he said is true and no one believed it was true in any literal way so this is one of blake's blake being blake um but yeah, th there was a real fascination with the marvelous boy, Thomas Chatterton, and a, a whole lot of ill will directed at a narrow minded critical establishment that didn't get what he was really doing. So that's the one I'd say fits in with that narrative best. McPherson went to his grave bitterly demanding that these were not forgeries. That, no one really believed him at that point. Collier's case, you know, is motivated by class resentment too. Yeah. Collier was, was, you know, working man yeah. and loved, you know, and hated all of these more aristocratic. I mean, that seems to be a theme running through a lot of these cases that there's kind of, there's class resentment, desire to deceive the so-called intelligence. Yeah. And of course, we still have that, I think, yeah. with the Shakespeare authorship controversy, which is, I think, largely motivated by the same thing. Like, yeah. those eggheads don't actually know what they're talking about, and, and I'll show them up. Uh, and for, for Chatterton, certainly it was a class thing. He was poor. He was, he was killed by Horace Walpole, who turned him down and said he wasn't interested. Nonsense. Um, he was actually doing very well as a periodical writer. And though I showed you the, the famous picture of Chatterton's suicide, latest thinking is he didn't commit suicide. He took too much arsenic to treat an STD and it killed him. But, um, but yeah, I, I think you're right that there, there is often a class, I mean, you can line up all the things. We've got national prejudice, we've got class prejudice, we've got just the sense that I am smarter than everybody else and no one recognizes it. So I'm going to demonstrate it by fooling everybody. Yeah, I, I have a question because if I was creating so many of these one what is it selling them? These collectors aren't talking to each other and don't have any yeah. sense that maybe I've got one and you've got one and they've got one. I'm just curious because I, I don't know enough about this, but. I have not yet found a single bit of correspondence among the people who bought these things saying, hey, wait a minute. Except maybe they didn't want to admit it. It may be they didn't want to admit it. I have, however, seen letters from Ireland and from Ireland's agent in selling these things. 
insisting emphatically that these are the unique originals. And there would be no need for that sort of insistence if there were no suspicion. So I don't know if anyone ever quite got to the point of saying, wait a second, Fred has one of those and Jim has one of those, and how can that be? But clearly people were anxious about it. And he was selling these things at four guineas, which was heap big money. In, yeah, well, I was just also, you know, was he selling in different areas so maybe people don't, I, I, you know, how, how did they sold? Yeah. It, it varied over time. And at times he would do things like sell an autograph album of famous people's autographs where he would say, I have forged, here's Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth's autograph, and here's Mary, Queen of Scots autograph. And he sold it as this is a specimen of my forgeries of nothing. I mean, it's not particularly interesting in any case. Um, but yeah, he, he presented many different faces to the world at different times. So, so when he's doing the love letters, those he doesn't later on admit to, or he, well, he admits it, but he, you know, what's the timeline for doing all of the fake fakes versus the admitting that he's been making them? So he confesses to the world in 1796, shortly after the collapse of Vortigern, uh, when he really has no choice but to confess. Um, in December 1796, he publishes his first pamphlet autobiography, I Done It, Here's How I Done It, Ain't I Wonderful. He then published a few Gothic novels and collections of poetry that did not do very well. The earliest collection of bound album forgeries I can date is 18.5. So nine years after. That's not to say that there weren't any before that, but as early as 18.5, he was doing it. And I find them right up until he died in the 1830s. So he did it constantly. I mentioned one of my heuristics for telling whether something is likely to be an early fake or a fake fake is he settled on a narrow canon of greatest hits. So later he would sell the love letter to Anne Hathaway and here's the letter to Sir Walter Raleigh and here's, um, and not the receipts from the playhouse on this night. So when you find the documents that are not interesting, they're much more likely to be the early ones. Okay. Fascinating, thank you. This is great stuff, Jack. I, uh... I want to finish the had to go, I guess, but um, I feel like the Wharton quote, the Joseph Wharton quote that you shared was interesting because of Wharton's really very material interest, even though he says, hey, that's not what it's about. But it's almost like there's a, I feel like, yeah, you're trying to sort of tell us about a transition, but I feel like there's a kind of dialectic going on. They're, they're very materially conscious, some of them, even if they're choosing another kind of evidence on top. Yeah. And I almost feel like that story is a longer part of that story too, in terms of, you know, assessing Shakespearean text, it's style, and it's the connoisseurship argument in our history that, you know, is, is always in the mix, even, if, you know, the notion that we can judge by non-material factors and, you know, that, yeah. I, I, you know, and I, I just want to, you know, I don't know, that's a sort of different way of maybe looking at what I think you're you're absolutely right that, that the Wharton brothers were both very attuned to books as objects and manuscripts as objects and studied them as well as anybody did. What struck me as interesting there is he says outright, this is not the, the argument I want to make. Yeah. The real argument is based on taste. Yeah. And I mean, we couldn't imagine anyone making such an argument today. To, the, to this day, big discoveries, even when they're made on humanistic grounds, are not announced to the world until scientific methods figure them out. So if you think back to the discovery of Richard III in the car park, right. that was found by historians, reading sources, and archaeologists, and so on. And then the, the news story was, we've sequenced the DNA, we have discovered it's correct. 
uh, and it was a triumph of scientific investigation. No, it was a triumph of humanistic reading of documents. Uh, the fact that Wharton was saying, I, I'm not going to put my money on this material, this, he wouldn't have used the word, but we'd say scientific approach, suggested that the age he was living in thought that that sort of, his, his confidence in 15th century prosody yeah. was regarded as more reliable. Yeah, I just, just because of... well, well, doesn't that end up in art world though expertise for a long time continued yeah. even into the yeah. 20th century being based on taste and it's still but, it's still and there it still is you yeah. know and it's gotten lots of people in trouble yes when the scientific evidence has gone against it so i think it's kind of interesting to see how how that continues so long after I, I, at the risk of offending people, I mean, the, the case of the book that is validated without any material evidence in its time and continues to be accepted without any material evidence is the book of Mormon, mm -hmm. right, yeah. where mm -hmm. one validates it as faith. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, and that, right. again, that's the, that is a text that happened how many hundreds of millions around the world would test it genuinely. Right. With no material evidence whatsoever, and probably no philological evidence either. I mean, although that it's interesting because, of course, there's a lot of material evidence cited; it's just yeah. never present. But, yeah. but it's, it's an even more extreme case than yeah. than yeah. just yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. Right. It, it yeah. disappears before the time right. anybody is even interested in looking at it. Yeah. And of course, that's bound up with the the the, the Hoffman forgeries of early Mormon documents. So, and the Grolier Club has just acquired many of these, these forgeries um, where Hoffman knew perfectly well what the, the weaknesses, at least weaknesses in these terms were in the, the legitimate Mormon documents and went straight for those weak points to, to squeeze money out of them. But that's an interesting case too, thinking about your, the, the relationship between legalism and Forgery, because you know he targeted them to some extent while he was also lapsed, but yeah. he was targeting them because from the beginning, right, they were very more churches are very invested in legalistic, yeah. Yeah. affidavit yeah. style yeah. attestation. Right, there's the I think it's seven witnesses, is it seven? I can't yeah. remember yeah. who are famous for having seen it, you know, and then they write and sign their names yeah. that they saw that. So even there from the beginning, there is this. It's clearly drawing on courtroom procedure yeah. and, and, and process to to validate whereas you know earlier like when Theobald does double falsehood he just said I have a manuscript then he thought oh I don't have the manuscript oh it's gone I might have four there's no there's no sense that you know in a lot of these cases there's no sense of yeah having to produce any rational justification for why you can't see the manuscript yeah. it's kind of like well no one wanted to see it before, and now it's gone. Yeah, you know and that's that. Can, can I just add quickly about two of the things on the table? Apologies to the Zoomers. Um, one of them is, might is a little bit of a different example. So it's actually a 16 circa 1619 porno that Ireland has forged the name William Shakespeare. On. Yes. So that's that's a kind of yeah. <laughs> hybrid forger. I mean, is a you know. And that's interesting. I don't know how many of those there are. Which Furness clearly acquired part of the forgery. And my other question, if we have time, is it about the production of the great 1796 thing? I mean, that this sort of a question Peter would be interested in if you were, you know, like the careful engraving of the, the making of the copies of the forgery of yeah. this whole. That's an elaborate, expensive, complicated book. That many hands were involved in making, and I wonder what, what you know about that. It, it's a curious story. So it's got 1796 on the title page, came out Christ, Christmas Day, 1795, in two editions. Though, so there's the folio, which has engravings of all the documents, and there's an octavo that has just the texts. The octavo is much more common. It survives today. It is believed, though, if we hear it from Ireland, who was a pathological liar, so <laughs> who knows, but it is, it is believed that large numbers of the folio were destroyed. So there's something like 137 of them, though, which I, I bought one. I got one. 
<laughs> uh, but yeah, it was all prepared by Ireland's father. And while some people have suggested he was in on the forgeries, and in fact, in the early days, when people accused Ireland of forgery, they meant Papa Ireland. No one thought the kid was involved. But the best evidence is that he was, that, that Samuel Ireland was entirely deceived. And he prepared that with meticulous care. He also did it in a size to make it consistent with a, a complete edition of Shakespeare's works. So here's just another volume you can add on the shelf after it. Um, and he's, there, there's a preface to it, and then most of the documents have headnotes. And we've got multiple manuscript drafts of those headnotes and that preface. And he's changing his ways of presenting these documents subtly. So I've been collating this crap forever and have to publish it someday. Cool. Yeah. And the signature business? Is that the signature business. There is a whole collection of the Shakespeare library. <laughs> Some books, Ireland just added a signature. And it could be an actual early book by Shakespeare, in which he just signed it with his name. Others were supposedly books that Shakespeare might have read. And he would always at least sign them. And with some of them, he would write extensive marginalia and underlined passages. And he particularly liked you know, finding a passage in demonology and saying, hey, I've got an idea. I'm going to write something called Macbeth. <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit. But he was creating the, these notes of Shakespeare's thought process where I mean, he was clearly taking what was known about um, Shakespeare's sources and influences yeah. and trying to provide hard evidence of them. Um, we've got multiple lists of the Ireland Shakespeare Library. There was a list that Ireland made up, but he never actually found the books. Then there are the books that he did find. Then there's some he apparently found, but never made it on a list, list so we think they're Ireland. And I've tracked down as many of these as I can. We have one more question. For one more. Um, a kind of cautionary question. While there are often forges and fakes things in order to support assertions that he wishes were true, yeah. or that he believes as a scholar were true, textual hypotheses, for example, how common is this method? Ooh. I think it's, uh, so the question was, Collier seems to forge these things to, to support cases that he wishes were true. And how common is that? I absolutely agree that was a big part of what Collier did. Collier, of course, knew what he was doing and his, the things he wished were true are more interesting than, than with many. Um, but I, I yeah, as I think about that, it's probably fairly widespread. So just to look at the case of Shakespeare in 1723-25, Alexander Pope publishes his edition of Shakespeare, where all of the lines that didn't quite scan in the folios were clearly just errors of transmission. Shakespeare was a perfect Popian metrist. And he makes everything into perfect iambic pentameter, because that's what the 1720s needed to see. In the drafts, in, in the original manuscripts, so to speak, of Shakespeare's plays, and Ireland discovered, so to speak, not only Vortigern and Rowena and Henry II, never ever performed, but we have full texts of those. Uh, we've also got the full text, so to speak, of King Lear, and sections of ham Hamlet, <laughs> um, which includes T O E B E E O R R E N O T T E T O E B E E. So, yeah, that was his wacky spelling. In these putative original Shakespearean manuscripts, he's giving us the Shakespeare that the 1790s wanted to see in which Shakespeare is not concerned. He is above things like 
counting syllables on his fingers. So uh, for Pope's vision, Shakespeare writes impeccable metrical verse, and then sloppy publishers mess it up. Whereas for Ireland, he's a, a feeling soul. And then those meddling booksellers go in and try to tidy up his verse. So I think a lot of them were presenting versions of their forged objects that they wanted to believe were true. With someone like Macpherson, I mentioned that Hugh Blair, an antiquary, was providing support for these arguments. Um, I think there was a real dialectical relationship between Macpherson and Blair. We, we usually understand it as Macpherson wrote the, the poems, Blair provided commentary. In real life, I think they, it's unclear who knew what at what time, but they were feeding each other and they were presenting images of an ancient Scotland that, that Scotland really needed in the 1750s and 60s. So yeah, I think a whole lot of it goes, it is about producing evidence that they, they really need to believe, sometimes maybe cynically that the, the larger public will respond to this. But I think often as with someone like Collier, yeah, because that's what they really do want to believe, and it will bolster their case in the future. Now let's thank Jack. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you.